caterpillar tracks. Let's make some. Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and I'm the Vegel Guy. Caterpillar tracks, continuous tracks, dozer tracks, tank tracks, whatever you call them, I've always had a fascination with them. That incredible ability to go places other vehicles just can't. When I decided to have a go at making a fairly large scale model, I looked into various designs but was disappointed by the complexity of those that I found. They were way beyond the limitations of my basic toolkit. If I was going to build one in my garden shed, I had to come up with an easier method. One design I did like was by Matthias. I loved the simple approach and even toyed with making one from wood myself, but I wanted something a little bit more robust, so metal was my preference. Even so, the idea of making all those complex joints from metal terrified me. Steel would be incredibly resistant but hard to work, expensive and of course heavy, so I opted to use aluminium, or aluminium as our American friends say. Whilst this might seem a soft metal, it's surprisingly hard wearing, plus the old engineering trick of using hard and soft metals in unison comes to mind. The moment I started thinking about aluminium, it occurred to me that there were all manner of profiles or shapes available. Looking online at one particular website, I noted the dimensions of various profiles and had one of those eureka moments. I headed off to the local DIY store and purchased some of the smaller sections to produce this prototype. If you look closely, you can see there's a series of rectangular pieces connected together with nuts and bolts. Crucially, there's two sizes of U-channel involved, one of which fits neatly inside the other. This meant it was possible to make a flexible metal chain using off-the-shelf supplies with just ordinary tools. Obviously not this stuff, but something more like this. This is what you're looking for. If you build out of another material or use other dimensions, this is the sort of stuff you need to source. Good thick material, one of which slides neatly inside the other. With these profiles, I was able to make this mock-up, which became my continuous track. It's still the same simple engineering. It's just two sizes of U-sections, one slightly bigger than the other. It's nothing complex, just simple cuts. And to make it look more like proper track, I added some L-stock to the sides. But before we build any track, we need a sprocket. If you look at this image of a bulldozer track, you can see there's a sprocket. You'll be surprised how common the sprocket and chain combination is. How about the ordinary bicycle? The sprocket is the bit that you pedal and the chain drives the back wheel. The teeth of the sprocket connect with the chain and create the drive, as you can easily see in this image. Now I'm not going to cover the making of a sprocket in this video because I've already covered that before. But don't worry, if you want to build this exact same sprocket and track, you can download a free set of plans from my website here. This will enable you to make a wooden sprocket, i.e. a template, produce several foam sprockets using this template, then use lost foam casting to cast your own sprockets from scrap metal. I took ordinary soda cans and melted them down in my homemade metal foundry to make four of these sprockets. I decided on the dimensions of my sprocket using Matthias's excellent gear software program. If you want to build a sprocket or track system that's different dimensions to mine, you'll need to buy a copy of this. It's cheap enough and well worth the money. If you've got any interest in making sprockets or gears from wood or metal, it's well worth buying. Now an important aspect of sprockets is the fact that they need rollers within the chain. The dimension of these rollers in part determines the size of the sprocket. Other factors are the number of teeth, the diameter of the sprocket and the gap between the teeth. Again, Matthias's program really makes figuring all this out nice and simple. As I knew I needed rollers, I opted to use ordinary washers instead. They're really cheap and work fantastically. When I was working out my dimensions, I had two things in mind. The gap, which I wanted to be roughly an inch, and the diameter of the whole sprocket, which I wanted to be between about six and eight inches. This gap sizing is something you need to decide for yourself. I've shown this measurement as X on this diagram, and for me, of course, it was an inch. And this measurement, this gap between the teeth of the sprocket, 
has to be reproduced exactly on each link of the chain. Ready for some boring maths? Well, if you want to do your own thing, you'll need to determine the sizes of the links and you'll need to know the following. X, now this is the gap between the teeth and the sprocket and this is your personal preference. Y, this is the diameter of the holes to be drilled. You're going to be using bolts as pivot points, so it's going to be the diameter of those bolts that we need. Z, this is the amount of material to the edge of each link. The larger the better as strength is needed to prevent the material from ripping, but obviously we're limited on the overall size of the links in the chain. So this little formula will give you the length of each link, which is X plus Y plus 2Z. Now this is garden shed engineering, so getting every single cut to be identical is difficult, so using jigs is critical. I opted to use a standard electric miter saw to do the cutting work, and I fitted this with an appropriate blade. I added a wooden fence to the back of my saw, and a bolt stop to gauge the length. I also attached a few homemade clamps to secure the channel in place whilst cutting. The stopping, clamping, cutting, repeating process bored me senseless, but it's necessary to keep the pieces the same size, so don't skimp or rush. There's a few jigs needed to complete this project, and the ones I'm showing are really the minimum level you should use. Take your time in constructing jigs. The more accurate and secure you can make them, the more precise and better your results will be. Once you've finished all your cuts, it's a good idea to run a file along the edges to remove any burrs. You've probably cut a few hundred pieces by now, and it's going to be necessary to drill two holes in every single one of these. So locating the position of these holes is going to be critical. Again, we're going to use a jig. You'll need to calculate exactly where these holes are going to be, so more boring maths is going to be needed. In this diagram, you can see on the left the small and the large new channel links. On the right you can see how the smaller piece fits inside the larger and the position of the holes. In my design the smaller piece rests on the floor of the larger one, so you need to know how thick the material is, shown in this diagram as W. Now we already know what Y is, which is the size of the holes we need to drill, and Z is the distance to the edge of the material. So the dimension A represents the distance from the edge of the material to the centre of the drilling point. This is calculated by Z plus half of Y. Calculating B is thankfully much easier. That's pretty much up to you. As long as you take into account W, in other words the thickness of the material, and leave plenty of space around the hole Y, then you're okay. I think without a drill press this would be a very difficult project to do. So if you haven't got one, you might want to borrow or hire one just for this project. This jig appears pretty rustic thanks to the very scrap piece of MDF which acts as a backrest. The small metal tab acts as a stop. As crude as this is, it's still quite tricky to set up, so don't be surprised if you waste a few links in trying. Errors creeping, make sure you've got spares. Once drilled, the piece can be flipped over so the drilling points appear on the other side, allowing for two holes to be drilled at once. As long as the lengths of the pieces are consistent, this will work fine. This jig is too crude if I'm going to be honest. You're going to be drilling a lot of holes and mistakes can slip in, so make sure that your jig is nice and supportive. Here's the same jig again being used for the smaller U-channel. To compensate for the depth of the material, a scrap piece of the L-channel is secured against the backrest. Other than that, it's just the same again. More drilling, flipping and drilling. When it comes to drilling the L-channel, the same jig works fine for the left-hand hole. However, if we flip the piece over, 
cannot lie flat. This means we can't draw the right hand side without structural changes to the jig. I kept the same backrest but positioned a stop on the left. Furthermore, I added a supporting piece to the front. This meant the piece was supported on three sides, making it fairly stable, though ideally the work should be clamped. The better the jig, the better your results, believe me. With all the pieces cut, I chose to use some strong epoxy adhesive to bond the large U and Ls together. Gluing helps in handling for the further machine work that's coming up, but it's still an optional stage. The bolts are used to ensure alignment and the pieces rest on a flat block whilst drying to make certain that the bottom of each track is nice and flat. Hopefully, if you've been nice and careful with your cutting and drilling, everything will line up perfectly. However, some minor imperfection can creep in, so now is a good time to remove this. I found an ordinary belt sander makes easy work of this. Make sure that the belt is spinning away from you. If you lose grip and something comes flying off, it's best to go in the opposite direction. To enable the flexibility in the chain so that it can wrap around the sprockets, it's necessary to trim off some of the corners. Again, the mitre saw is the ideal tool for this job. I found that an angle of 25 degrees works nicely, but you can adjust that according to your needs. This certainly allowed for the level of movement I required, whilst not taking away too much material. Of course, trimming such small pieces with a mitre saw is going to be a little dangerous, so jigs are necessary again. When it came to the bottom edge of the small U section, I inserted a bolt into the fence to secure the work firmly, though two bolts would have been better. I decided to assist the glue with some permanent fixings. I managed to find these small bolts which were actually advertised as Meccano compatible, so that should give you an idea of how small they are. I bored four 3.5mm holes into each of the sections and tapped them through with an M4 thread. This enabled the bolt to screw into the wood itself. The addition of a little threadlock paste should stop anything from coming loose. Now when I was doing some cutting, the glue did fail on me a few times, so you might want to think about using these small bolts before you actually do any cutting. I decided to round up all the corners on my belt sander. Now this isn't strictly necessary, but I did like the look of it. With all the pieces rounded over, it's time for assembly. And this is quite easy, but it can be a little fiddly. It's a simple matter of beginning with one of the fittings, say the larger link, and inserting into this the smaller one. A bolt and washer secure the intersection with a locking nylon nut. Then another piece is added, the larger, then the next, smaller, and so on, forming an interlock chain. Inserting the washers that form the rollers can be very fiddly. My fat fingers struggled with this, but here's a handy tip that will save your sanity. Count out the number of washers you need and place them on a spare bolt. These should fit comfortably between the gap in the smallest U-channel. Using some tape, enclose all the washers and leave a scraggy end to make removal easier. This roll of washers is simple to insert. Slide the bolt through it, add a washer, add a nut, and then repeat the process. To me, the washers have a major advantage over using rollers. They have a little play in them, and this allows for sliding accuracies of our garden shed engineering. The nut should not be fully tightened. A small gap is required to allow the bolt to rotate freely, while still holding everything securely. This is critical to ensure smooth and free movement of each link. If you begin with a large section, then you should end with a small section, 
so that these two can be connected to form a loop, counting only the largest sections for convenience. Each track in my case was made up of 40 connected links. And that pretty much covers the making of the track. It's as simple as that. I made a frame from one inch square box steel, added a couple of wheelchair motors and two car batteries to power them. One thing I did realize as I put mine together was that the track really did need supporting in the center. As I was keen to test it as quickly as possible, I produced a couple of wheels from MDF, which is not the best choice of material. Thankfully, it was the ideal thickness. I will be casting a couple of wheels, maybe four. I haven't made my mind up yet. These don't need to be sprockets as round supports work fine. So, will these tracks last forever? Of course not. If I wanted heavy duty usage, I'd have gone with steel. But with that said, I've probably had 20 hours of play on this already. And other than a little dirt and light scratching where the tracks meet the ground, there's no sign of wear at all. So that's it guys. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you have, please like it. Remember, plans are available for free on my website if you want to build exactly the same one. If not, reading through the webpage will help you calculate your own measurements. If you haven't subscribed yet guys, please do and take a look at my other videos. So that's it guys, thanks for watching.